So I am now uh, very happy to be bringing to our virtual stage um, uh, Christine Carson. Uh, she is a microbiologist in Perth, Australia, and one of the upsides of going virtual is that we've been able to have speakers like Christine come to us all the way from Australia. Um, so it is a bit, bit after midnight, so we are really excited uh, and really <laughs> grateful to Christine uh, for doing this. Um, and she's going to speak to us about how our failure to document C. diff and other infections and death certificates is a sort of form of collective denial about the dangers of antimicrobial resistant infections. So uh, Christine, would you like to join us here on camera? Let's try that. There we go. Let's try that. Hey. There you are. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> everybody. How are you doing if it was <laughs> good night? <laughs> um, so we're so pleased for you to be here. Um, and whenever you're ready, we'd like you to take it away and start your presentation. Okay, so I'm just going to bring my, is my uh, presentation visible to you? Uh, no, you need to go ahead and share. Yeah, yep. Share. Here we go. That should be it now, coming up in a few seconds. You're good to go. So I'm going to pop off camera, and uh, when Christine is done with her presentation, we will come back on camera to answer your questions. All right, take it away, Christine. All right, thanks, Christian. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today to speak to you about. Um, the manner in which we record um, episodes of antimicrobial resistant infections, including Clostridium difficile. And this talk came out of a blog piece that I wrote for the Longitude Prize um, people. And that blog was entitled Death by Delusion, the same title that I have today. And it really makes the point that counting matters. So I wanted to show this death certificate, quite an early one from 1862 during the Civil War in the United States. And this soldier died of a gunshot wound, but they took the time to add to the death certificate that the gunshot wound was followed by gangrene in the feet. So obviously this soldier had been wounded, subsequently got an infection, and in all likelihood probably died of that overwhelming infection. So gangrene, of course, is caused by another member of the clostridial bacterial family, um, Clostridium perfringens, um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with Clostridia. So here's another death certificate, and this one's of a young child um, who died of diphtheria. So this is a little bit more contemporary. This is earlier last century. And I think it's very important to remember that it's less than 100 years ago. In this case, this one's slightly older than a century. But less than 100 years ago, we were dying frequently from bacterial infections. So people would get a bacterial infection that today we would regard as minor. The infections would progress, there was no effective systemic treatment for them, and people would die. And seeing infectious diseases as causes of death on death certificates was not that uncommon 100 years ago. In the bottom right hand of this death certificate, you can see cause of death was as follows, one word, diphtheria. That's just not something we would imagine seeing today. So what really changed that story was, quite literally, the miracle of antibiotics. In 1928, Fleming made a chance observation when he saw that the growth of a fungus on a plate inhibited the bacteria that were also on that plate. There were zones of clearance around the fungi. In the late 1930s, um, some of his colleagues, so mainly Flory, Chain and Abraham, purified the compound that was causing that effect. And in 1940, clinical tests began. So by the end of the Second World War, large scale production of penicillin was underway on two continents and the antibiotic era had begun. 
It was truly amazing. So we'd gone from practically zero in the late 1930s to multi-continent production sufficient to supply the needs of the Allies in their final push to end the war. But there was a note of caution needs to be added to that. Even as clinical tests were beginning in humans, um, Abraham and Chain, two of the men who were involved in purifying penicillin and mass producing it, reported that E. coli was capable of producing an enzyme that could destroy penicillin. So even as this magical compound was being invented, refined and, and produced for everybody, we had already observed that the time could come where organisms could resist the action of the agent. So a couple of years later, people made the first report of penicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Nevertheless, penicillin and many other antibiotics from related and unrelated classes of antibiotic families came after, and they quite literally revolutionised the treatment of bacterial infection. No longer did people have to die from gangrene, from a wound, or from diphtheria. Antibiotics were truly amazing. So that was the miracle of antibiotics then. Now we have the miracle of antibiotics at present time. Over those 80 or so years since antibiotics were first used in humans, there's been a gradual decline in the antibiotic effectiveness. And it's a classic example of evolution in action. We've put compounds in front of bacteria that they cannot survive and they have ducked and weaved and evolved ways of resisting those compounds. And over those eight decades, bacteria have become increasingly resistant. And they're very generous. They share resistances with each other. Um, you know, they have parts of their genome that can be mobilized and sent out into the world to be captured by other bacteria who then also acquire those antibiotic resistant traits. At the same time as the bacteria have been gearing up to resist the compounds we use to treat them, the range and number of new antibiotics that we have been discovering and developing has diminished. So there are two forces working against us here. Um, and it turns out that now infections that have been quite frankly irrelevant to multiple generations are becoming clinically important again. We're seeing infections cause serious conditions and death in people, and infections that haven't caused those things for decades. The picture, um, the first picture on this slide just illustrates a classic example of a test that is used to assess antimicrobial susceptibility, whether or not a bacterium can be inhibited by an antibiotic. And the plate on the left that has the large circular clear areas is a plate with multiple antibiotic discs on it. So each disc has got a slightly different antibiotic on it. There's one organism spread across the whole plate. And then the clear zones are the areas around a particular antibiotic where the bacterium can't grow because the antibiotic prevents it from growing. The plate on the right is the, um, the same antibiotic discs, but it's an organism that is resistant to those antibiotics. And so you can see that the, the areas of clearing are much smaller or non-existent because the organism is able to resist those antimicrobial agents. And now we have many dire warnings of antimicrobial resistance is going to overwhelm us all. And by 2050, superbugs could be killing 10 million people a year. That's a figure that came out of a World Health Organization report. Um, the popular press um, is also talking about this a lot more now as they should be. And this one is what would a world without antibiotics be like? And in fact, the CDC and the World Health Organization, as I mentioned earlier, have produced multiple reports trying to um, present the magnitude of the problem and 
ideas and strategies for how to address the problem. And in fact, CDC, one of the organisms, one of the groups of organisms that they consider to be a priority group of organisms are um, Clostridium difficile or Clostridioides difficile. Meanwhile, back at the ranch with antimicrobial resistance, you could be forgiven for thinking that perhaps while antimicrobial resistance is a problem, it doesn't really kill anyone. Um, in the 2013 CDC report on antimicrobial resistance, um, you can read that the CD estimates that in the United States, more than two people get sick every year with antibiotic resistant infections. And the estimates are based on conservative assumptions and are likely minimum estimates. They are the best approximations. So for all our skill in being able to appreciate that there is a problem with antimicrobial resistance, we actually have very poor figures on it. It's very difficult data to collate from the records using the records that we collect at the moment. Another seminal report was the 2014 um, Jim O'Neill report from the UK. One of the comments in there, he doesn't labour the point very much, but in passing, he mentions the severe lack of data and the fact that the numbers that they came up with in that report are a broad brush estimate. So again, there's that problem that we simply don't have high quality, accurate data on how many people are getting sick each year with, resistant, with infections caused by bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. And we certainly don't know very accurately how many people are dying from those infections. The best we've got are estimates. And if you take antibiotic resistance to the final end game, and you talk about the number of people dying from these infections, you might be forgiven for thinking that perhaps you could get some information from death certificates. But it turns out that in contemporary times at least, death certificates don't tend to refer to antimicrobial resistant infections. Death certificates will often provide several layers of information about what led to the death of a person, but it's not common even if antibiotic resistant infections were involved, for them to be mentioned on the death certificate. And Dame Sally Davies, the former chief medical officer in the UK, remarked once that one of the problems is that families often don't know that their relative's death was because of infection. And families are rarely told that the infection was resistant to treatment because it looks as if the NHS, their medical care system is failing. And she, she admitted we shy away telling that last bit. And meanwhile, death certificates don't really collect the data. She commented that she would love death certificates to record when people die of infection, and particularly if antibiotic resistance has been involved, because that would wake people up to these deaths. There would be a heightened awareness that antimicrobial resistance and infections, and both of those two things combined, are contributing to significant um, mortality in the community. So I felt this was a little bit of a don't ask, don't know kind of situation. If you don't ask the question, you won't be confronted with an answer that you are a little bit uncomfortable with. And I feel quite strongly, as do many others, that in order to address a problem, you simply have to know the magnitude of the problem before you can really start addressing it. And death certificates may be one way of estimating the size of the problem, but I suspect death certificates may be too blunt an instrument to actually do this well. They may simply be too crude a measure. Um, and I'll give you one example why. Went back through the literature and found an excellent paper by Weller and colleagues. It's this death certification following MRSA bacteremia in England from the beginning of 2004 to the end of 2005. So they 
covered a full two-year period. And in fact, this study was a sub-study of a much larger one where they had linked very major data sets together to look very closely at outcomes in people who have a bloodstream infection with an MRSA, so a methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus infection. And the, the larger study did what it needed to do. And meanwhile, this study that I'm showing here looked much more closely at in those people who had had a bloodstream infection that was known to be caused by a methicillin resistant Staph aureus and they had died, what was written on their death certificate? Now that sounds like a fairly simple task um, and, it, and death certificates try to use an, um, an internationally standardized set of codes, these ICD codes, and they're used worldwide so that there is some harmony from country to country and we can compare causes of death between countries. So the first list of codes, now there isn't just one code for MRSA bacteremia, life couldn't possibly be that simple. So the first thing they had to do was go through and find the codes that appear here in this box one and it doesn't really matter what they are except that there's about 10 of them. So they have to go through all these death certificates and look for those codes and that will pick up some of the infections that led to death that included MRSA. And you think, okay, well, that's 10 codes. That's not too bad. But then it turns out that that doesn't actually capture all of the infections that were caused by MRSA in the bloodstream that led to death. And in fact, they needed to look for all of these codes too, because each person writing a death certificate might write it slightly differently, with a slightly different emphasis, and with a slightly different thought process than the next certifier. So they had to look for all of the codes that were on box one list, and then they had to look for any of the codes that were listed here in box two, and in fact, it even got more complicated than that. They even needed to look through these last five codes here listed in box five. Now, what they found was that of more than 5,300 MRSA bloodstream infections that were subsequently linked to death during the two years, only 4.9% of the death certificates showed MRSA as the underlying cause. And no one's suggesting that all 100% of the death certificates should say that MRSA was the underlying cause, but 4.9% showing it as the primary underlying cause seems quite low. They found another 9.4% that mentioned MRSA, although it wasn't the primary cause. And they found uh, a few more that mentioned Staph aureus, but not necessarily methicillin resistant organisms. So all up, it was about 15% of death certificates from people who died with an MRSA bacteremia infection actually mentioned Staph aureus or methicillin resistant Staph aureus on the death certificate as the underlying cause of death or as a contributor to death. So one of the things that they noticed in this study was that the timing of the death seemed to influence greatly whether or not MRSA was recorded on the certificate. And, and that's, that comes down to some of the diagnostic tests that are used to determine whether somebody has a methicillin resistant Staph aureus. Sometimes people would die literally before the test results were back in um, saying whether or not the Staph aureus was resistant to methicillin or susceptible to methicillin. And if they died before those results were in, then the certifier wouldn't necessarily think to wait for those results. They would just write the death certificate. And a couple of days later, a result showing that an MRSA was involved might come in. 
So sometimes just the timing around death and the, the rate at which the diagnostic tests come in can influence what goes on to that death certificate. So death certificates are quite complicated in the way that they get executed and they may not be the best place for us to find that data. The whole story about antibiotic resistance is further complicated by the fact that the tests were used to diagnose bacterial infection in the first place and what antibiotic to treat that infection with, they take time. So we know that bacterial infections can be treated with antibiotics. And once a serious bacterial infection has been diagnosed, a second round of tests is done called antimicrobial susceptibility tests. And these antimicrobial susceptibility tests are performed on the bacterium that came out of someone's infection. So if you present to hospital and you've got a bloodstream infection, they'll take some of your blood, and in fact, that's the, the blood culture in the figure at the bottom of the slide. They will culture that for 12 to 24 hours until an instrument goes bing and says that, that an organism has grown. A sample is taken and they do something called a gram stain. So they'll take a sample out of the bottle, they'll stain it up a special way and they'll look at it down a microscope and they'll decide if it's gram positive or gram negative. And that, to a certain extent, dictates what antibiotics the patient will be given, even before they know the name of the organism. Then they will take a sample of that blood that they know has got an organism in it, and they'll put it onto um, another culture medium, they'll put it onto an agar plate, and they'll grow it for another 24 hours so they can get more of it and see it growing in pure culture. And then they'll identify it. And then they'll finally go on and do a test to find out which antibiotics are capable of killing it. And that's the blue section, the AST, the antimicrobial susceptibility test. So all of that can take 48 or in fact up to 72 hours. So it can be two to three days before you know if there's a, a bacterium present, what the bacterium is and what antibiotics will kill it. And quite frankly, two to three days is an awfully long time when you are that seriously ill. It gets better. <laughs> Once you have the organism and you want to do that AST test, then there are a number of approaches that you can take. You have to remember that every bacterium is different and they can... They can vary based on what part of the body they came out of. They can vary by what antibiotic resistances they're capable of. And then there's evolutionary selection as well. So antimicrobial susceptibility tests kind of fall into two main approaches. One on the left is that AST, which is just an antimicrobial susceptibility test. And that is a completely comprehensive test that covers all bases. The other test that's being used a little bit more these days is this AMR detection, antimicrobial resistance detection. And it quite literally can detect if resistance is present. It's just a yes or a no answer. But if you don't ask the right question, you don't get the right answer. So while antimicrobial susceptibility testing is completely comprehensive and covers all your bases. Antimicrobial resistance detection will only pick up what you ask about. So if you ask about a particular resistance, you will get a yes or a no answer. If you don't ask the right questions, you won't get any answer at all. And there are multiple antimicrobial susceptibility tests, most of which rely on growing the organism in the presence of a range of concentrations of antibiotics and seeing where the organism grows and where it doesn't grow. So I've mentioned that antimicrobial susceptibility tests fall into two categories. The first category is those genomic genotypic tests where you only need to really be able to detect the DNA of the organism and you, you try and detect whether or not there is DNA for a particular resistance mechanism. 
So does this organism have the DNA inside it that will allow it to resist penicillin? Does it have the DNA inside it that will let it resist vancomycin? And they're the yes or no binary answers and you can very quickly find out whether your organism is resistant to penicillin or resistant to vancomycin. And that's one of the main attractions of those kinds of tests. They can be very rapid. And if you know what you're looking for, then they can be very accurate. But if there are new types of antibiotic resistance circulating that your laboratory isn't geared up to test for yet, that your tests can't pick them up. So while they're rapid and you can get an answer back in, gosh, four to six hours, um, which certainly beats, you know, 48 to 72 hours, they can't pick up everything. So they're not totally comprehensive. And that's a big trade-off. You, you know, you can take a chance and rule out some antibiotics but you probably still have to go on and do the second type of testing, the phenotypic test, where you grow the organism in the presence of a range of antibiotics at different concentrations, and you get a completely comprehensive picture about which antibiotics will actually kill the organism and which ones won't. So if we return to the main part of the story, we know that antimicrobial resistance is a huge problem. We know that. But the net effect of all the variation that we see in the organisms, in the antibiotics, in the resistance determinants as they circulate around the world, we don't, and the way that we re make records of those things, we don't really know how big the problem is. In fact, there was a study that came out in um, BMC Medicine in 2018, and I've highlighted a part in the abstract in red that says, despite the long-standing recognition of antimicrobial resistance across many settings, there is surprisingly poor information about its geographical distribution over time and trends in its population prevalence and incidence. So the point they're making there is that even though we have known for a really long time that antimicrobial resistance is a pretty big problem, we have very little fine detail about that problem. And that's a really difficult place to be. Very difficult to persuade people to do things differently, to improve practice, to fund research. If you can't express very clearly the magnitude of the problem to them. So counting quite literally matters. <coughs> Found this example um, and thought it might be relevant to, particularly to this audience. Um, and it's an article about Clostridium difficile and the types of um, requirements that different states have for the reporting of Clostridium difficile, particularly healthcare associated infections. So this was quite a short paper, but it did a very good job of documenting the requirements in each state and territory in the United States. And it identified a couple of approaches. Some states have sort of fully legislative approaches to what needs to be done when a Clostridium difficile infection occurs in a healthcare setting. And others took a more pragmatic approach. They didn't go down the legislative pathway. They just decided that they needed to have um, like a reporting process um, that would collect that data. But the bottom line was that either approach got them the all important data that they needed to start understanding the magnitude of the problem. Um, that was quite an interesting read. It was 2015 and it was looking at um, conditions up until about 2011 or 12. I don't know if this paper has been subsequently updated. But back to the story about what we do and don't know about antimicrobial resistance. We're very alarmed about antimicrobial resistance. We know it's a big problem. There's lots of hand waving. There's lots of headlines and angst. But the bottom line is, we don't know how big the problem is. 
And that makes it very hard to persuade people that urgent action is required. Very difficult to say, oh, we've got this massive problem and we need to do something about it now. And people will say, well, how big is the problem? And, and you know, that's kind of where we stop because we don't have the detail. So we're very alarmed, but we need to transition to being alert. We need better data. We probably need to consider whether we need to make at least some types of antimicrobial resistance notifiable or reportable, depending on the terminology that you're familiar with. And we just need data, data, data. That's key to everything. So how on earth are we going to transition to being alert rather than staying just alarmed? I found this illustration quite useful and starting on the right hand side, I was interested to see that number one was awareness. So that's obviously something that this foundation is very familiar with. And the second point they make is that surveillance you just need continuous collection of high quality data and you need to analyze it. There's no point in just collecting it for collecting sake. It has to be analyzed. And one thing that data scientists will tell you over and over again is that once you start analyzing data, you soon find out how useful it is, what you can jettison and what you might need to add to be able to make that data particularly useful. And then there are other steps that follow on from that. But I, I thought it was significant that in terms of addressing antimicrobial resistance, this was part of a World Health Organization global action plan, that the primary steps were regarded as awareness followed by surveillance. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present today and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Carson. That was really great. Uh, if you want to turn your camera on, we can see if folks have any questions for us. So it's interesting that you report that you mentioned about the state uh, reporting mandates. That's actually uh, Julie Regan is a former board member <laughs> of ours. Oh, <laughs> so I saw you bring that up. I was like, ah, I know her. Um, well, I'm hoping that you were already aware of it. So that's excellent. <laughs> um, yeah, we actually um, have been looking at introducing some stuff at the state level. Um, so, uh, you know, that's something that um, <clears throat> that we've been interested in. Um, let me see if folks have any questions. Um, you know, one of the things that, <clears throat> I mean, I'm sure you've been paying uh, some attention to the current issue with, with COVID here in the US, but, you know, in New York, um, and this has been different from state to state, but there was a decision made to kind of presume that people died of COVID-19 um, as opposed to like wait for testing to come back. Like if they met various criteria, the feeling being that since we're not testing as much as we needed to, um, that, you know, we were better off overestimating than underestimating. Um, oh, here we have, uh, we have some questions. Um, so Lauren Levy asks, how can one get AMR testing, especially if they have had C. diff multiple times with multiple recurrences? Does the C. diff need to be active? Would it show up in your bloodstream? That might be more of a clinical question, but do you have any? Yeah, it, it, it is more of a clinical question. Um, I'm... I'm almost intrigued by the inclusion of C. difficile in the antimicrobial resistance story, but then I'm not. So, anti so Clostridium difficile infection is intimately linked with the use of antimicrobial agents and, you know, the annihilation of the gut flora, giving the Clostridium difficile an opportunity to replicate and take over. So I can see partly why it's in there. Also, there is genuine... 
resistance to antimicrobial agents emerging in, in Clostridioides difficile. So, um, at the moment, my feeling would be that C. difficile infection is a problem in and of its own. It, it's already an issue um, without the added burden of it being antimicrobial resistant. So, um, and I still think that trying to re-establish the normal flora is probably key to beating C. difficile infection, regardless of whether it's antimicrobial resistance or not. Um, so while if you have protracted repeated episodes, finding out what the susceptibility of your C. difficile to antibiotics is, is probably reasonably important. Um, it's probably more important to work on trying to re-establish a normal yeah. fecal flora. Cool, thank you. Uh, so we have another one. Um, uh, are there any examples in the literature of how improving, <coughs> excuse me, are there any examples in the literature of how improving reporting policies resulted in a clinical benefit for infection control worldwide? Oh, probably, but it's probably on quite a long time scale. Like I don't know that you would, it wouldn't be anything that happens in a one, two or three year period. It would be, um, where you get procedures in place where perhaps it's the contamination of the environment um, after people with patients with C. difficile have been in there. So that if, if people have to track that, then there's heightened awareness that rooms can be contaminated and then more care is taken decontaminating them and then over time you see a reduction in the infections of subsequent patients going into those rooms. So I think those kinds of um, you know, acquiring data, reporting on them, changing practice and having improved outcomes. I think those processes occur, but they're quite long, you know, they're, they're multiple years. Yeah, I mean, there was just a new study um, in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, by Cliff McDonald and a few other uh, researchers here in the U.S. looking at the burden of C. diff in hospitals in the U.S. from 2011 to 2017, and there there was a drop off, and that mm -hmm. you know it relates with increased yeah. reporting with CMS, uh, with you know Medicare and Medicaid having uh, sort of punitive measures that they have high you know with antibiotic stewardship programs coming online. Um, but I, it's difficult to say which one of those things is giving us the most benefit. But I think. Um, as you were put in the presentation, like the more data we gather, gather and the more that we assess it, I think the more that we're able to find these things, um, you know, over the long term. Um, do you have any other questions for Dr. Carson? Yes. All right. Well, I think that your presentation was just so uh, comprehensive that you left them <laughs> with no questions. Um, so, thank you so, you. so much for <laughs> staying up late <laughs> uh, to speak with us and to present with us. It's a wonderful presentation. Um, we really appreciate your support, um, and we would, um, you know, hopefully, we would love to stay in touch and maybe have have more of your insights in the future. Okay. That would be excellent. All right, All thank right. you so much, thank Dr. Carson. Much. All right, so um, we are going to take a short break, uh, but let me tell you what we have coming up next. So. Um, next at 110, uh, we're going to have a presentation about the perceived quality of life among C. diff patients in the U.S. Um, we have over the years heard from thousands of people who have battled C. diff infections. Um, obviously, there are the issues of, of gastrointestinal distress, diarrhea, nausea, fever. But beyond that, many people who battle C. diff um, 
they become afraid of leaving their house. They develop anxiety. Um, they have a fear of infecting their family. They worry they'll never get better. And all of this has a really uh, deleterious impact on their quality of life. Um, so when we come back at 110, we're going to have a presentation um, by Lise Lorraine, uh, who's a pharmacist who works for De Volterra, a French company that is developing a new preventative for C. diff. Um, and so uh, because she could not be with us live, um, her video is going to be pre-recorded. So we will start that at 110. And then um, her presentation uh, is about 27 minutes long. Um, so at about 135, uh, me and her colleague, uh, Pierre Alain Bandanelli, um, will be back live to answer any questions you have uh, following Lisa's presentation. So um, this is a good time to get up, stretch your legs, uh, take a little bathroom break if you need to, um, and join us back here at 110. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we are, um, you can certainly visit, at, check out the polls tab. Um, you can certainly check out our uh, sponsors in the expo hall. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, and then I forgot to drop the link, um, if you are able to at this point uh, to help us um, by making a donation, we would really greatly appreciate that. Um, so I've just dropped a link. Um, and so my recommendation is to visit our sponsors for this year's event. Uh, check out the polls and answer them. Um, and then before we come back at 110, make us a little donation if you can do that. Um, so thank you again to Dr. Carson. We're looking forward to the next presentation and we will see you back here at 110.